All right, I'm going to get started pretty soon here. Um, the one thing I want to be sure everyone knows is that there that this is an interactive session. So ask your questions. You know, it's a Q and A session, so there have to be questions out there in order for this to be uh, truth in advertising. So go ahead and share your questions. You can share them during the presentation or at the end, whichever you're, you know, you feel most comfortable with. I'm, I'm fine either way. I actually like to give in-person presentations and I like to answer questions on the fly. So um, I, I'd be more comfortable with that than, than less. Um, and then we have uh, most of the staff on with us today. Miles, Lish, and Sarah are all on with me. Marla couldn't make it. Um, she is dealing with uh, health issues with her mom. So um, she's with her mom today. And uh, so we're thinking about her and she wishes she were here, but she couldn't make it. Um, and then our topic today, it's a question and answer session about what's going on in international programs. Um, but we do have a bit of a focus. And, and today we really wanna focus on our partner organizations and what does it mean to be a, a partner organization based group like Water First. So the, the presentation sort of has that filter. There are about 10 different filters we can take when we present about Water First. Um, and so um, today's, today's focus is partner organizations. All right, we're five minutes in, so I'm gonna get started on the presentation. Um, and Miles, keep your eyes open and let people in as they come in. What are we up to now? 13? Okay. Um, but my name's Kirk Anderson and I'm Director of International Programs. Thanks for joining us today and for being part of this question and answer session. This is something that we want to do throughout the year. And now that we're all comfortable with Zoom across the country, we figure we can do this um, without having to exclude anyone. So folks in Chicago, folks in Boston, for, folks in Portland can participate in the same events that people in Seattle could participate in before when it was person to person. So we're gonna try and keep this, um, this format going um, through the year and maybe even um, on into the future. A quick overview of uh, Water First, uh, about us, who we are. So we've been around since 2005. Uh, we have programs in four countries, Honduras, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, um, and Mozambique. The caveat being that Mozambique right now, um, as of January, we've put that on an official um, hold because of basically a civil war that's taking place in Northern Mozambique. So that situation is um, has to be resolved by the government before our partner organization can safely operate again in that region. So, um, so the active programs right now are in three countries, and we're in a search for um, a new program in Africa. Water First partners with locally based organizations and local governments. That's our sort of our focus on, on today's in today's presentation is what are those locally based organizations? And um, one thing that is characteristic of Water First projects is we pipe water to every house, school, clinic, whatever institution people are regularly using in their community, it needs to have a water connection. And we also um, provide real toilets, not latrines. And we're talking about um, toilets that have a water seal or what we call flush toilets, because that's a toilet that truly isolates human waste from the environment. And, and so it's, it's clean, it's convenient, it's best for your health, and there's no smell, so people use them more. And that's the goal of toilets is that people use them. And to date, we've supported uh, 3,500 projects, benefiting over 243,000 people. So today's presentation, uh, quickly, I'm gonna explain why Water First exists. There's a lot of organizations out there and uh, Water First is a little bit different. So I wanna share a little about that. And today's focus is the local partner approach, as I said before. So I wanna talk about what's a local partner, 
uh, what, what role does that local partner play versus Water First? And then how do crises such as COVID demonstrate the strength of this particular approach? So why did we start uh, Water First? Well, the, uh, the world water crisis is caused by poverty. And when there's a lack of resources invested in uh, marginalized communities, then they don't have access to water, they don't have access to toilets. And the result is major um, health benefits, major economic impacts to those communities. And they're trapped in a cycle of poverty. So a water project is the best way to break that cycle. Um, the benefits that a water project brings to a community are enough to give them that foothold they need to emerge from poverty and start to experience, you know, start to save, establish savings, um, experience better health. But there's another um, aspect that we like to focus on. And the water project is an opportunity for a community to build some structures that they can use to apply to other challenges they face beyond just water and sanitation. So the local partner organization is key in that element of a water project in building that local capacity. So what is a local partner organization? So all over the world, um, you have People who, like here in the United States, see the problems surrounding them and say, you know, I want to get involved in solving that issue, in, in addressing that problem. And they form organizations like our nonprofit organizations. And it's interesting that in a lot of these low resource countries, many of them focus on water, toilets, sanitation. And there's an entire sector called the WASH sector. When, and that's an acronym that stands for water, the W and A. Sanitation is the S and that's toilets and then hygiene and hygiene education. And water first belief is that um, everywhere you go, every community you enter is rich in talent, is rich in human resources. So they may lack um, economic resources, material resources, but they have incredible uh, intelligence and they motivation and tapping into that is, um, is key to making these projects work. Recognizing you have a lot to work with and taking advantage of, um, of what they do have, the skills that they do bring to the table. So Water First role is, um, is to find excellence and then work collaboratively with those groups. So one, we identify and select really strong local partner organizations. And then over time, we work together with them collaboratively. And that means um, giving them the resources they need year after year, and hopefully gradually increasing those resources so that they can grow their programs and expand their impact um, on their community. Because the real goal is, is not just to do one water project in an area and then move on to another area. The real goal is, um, is to really transform an entire region. So you're looking at, in this photo, um, a group of our partner organization employees who work in one of the offices um, in DSK in Bangladesh. There are five different project offices there. So this group worked for about 10 years and you can see a little um, a map on the upper right hand corner there in the photo. They worked in this region called Kamranjir Char, which is on the outskirts of Dhaka for 10 years. 400,000 people live um, in that little island just on the other side of a branch of the river Buriganga and they work in Dhaka but they live in really rough circumstances there in Kamranjir Char. And this group of people worked their way through that community sort of block by block until they made sure everyone who needed access to water and a toilet and had hygiene education got that hygiene education. So, you know, we're really 
building their capacity to work in an extended period of time in a concentrated region to really transform that area. So the local partner's role is, of course, to teach um, some technical skills that when a water project is built, you can use local folks who need to manage it over the long run. They're gonna be the operators, maintainers, repairers of these water projects. So in the process of building a project, your local partner organization imparts technical skills to community members and not just one community member, you can, um, you can work with dozens in the, in the process of completing one of these projects. But it's not just the technical skills that, that our partner organizations are trying to build, they're also building organizational structures. So you, you need someone, um, the real test of these projects is what's gonna happen five years down the line? What's gonna happen 10 years down the line? Some people have to be equipped and organized to keep, um, keep those systems running smoothly um, beyond the completion date. So success in this area of, um, of project implementation is, is measured by how self-sufficient are these, these um, committees that our local partners form to manage the projects. How self-sufficient are they over time? Um, Honduras, um, here's a great example. Our local partner organization has not just coordinated, you know, one or two communities in a region. This meeting is a meeting of all the different um, water project committees in one region that they're working in. And they have five different regional meetings like this going on quarterly. So these people are coming every quarter to meet and discuss what's happening with their water projects, what challenges are they facing, what maybe technical refreshment they might need. Maybe one water committee no longer has a treasurer and they can't replace that person with someone who knows how to keep the books. So they need someone to come train the person who has replaced the old treasurer. So this ability to self-sustain these organizations over time is a great measure of how good a local partner is at this element of project implementation. So water first, uh, when we monitor projects, uh, one of the things we don't just look at is the water flowing? Um, is the water still meeting water quality standards? Are the toilets working? We also look at these local structures. Are they still functioning well? And of course, uh, one of the best ways to get at this question is uh, how well are they managing the money that they collect from each of the um, each of the project users, the people who are paying their monthly water bill, do they feel like their uh, monthly water fees are being managed well? So good, you know, getting into conversations about how well this money is being managed is, is a great way to understand how well these social structures are working. And another way to figure out if these social structures are working as planned is whether or not that particular structure is used to solve other problems. So here's a photo of a community in um, Bangladesh that also had a trash problem. No one was picking up their trash. So they decided, how do we want to deal with our, our trash issues? Well, we have this great, um, this great committee that's been working on water issues and toilet issues. Let's get them to work on the trash issue. So the, actually it's the water committee who started running a trash program and everyone paid them like 50 cents a week to collect their trash. And in many ways, um, building local capacity, the way that our local partners do and the way that the Water First works, gives communities uh, the ability to deal with just about everything that life throws at them. So some examples. Um, these are things that have actually happened in our project communities that our local partners have been um, really skilled at dealing with. 
So in 2019, uh, the largest cyclone that has hit Africa landed right in the middle of our, our project area. So um, you can see the that, can you see my cursor there? I'm circling Pemba. So right by the P there, Pemba is down here where the red dot is, but up here by the P is where our project um, area is. That's right at the heart of where um, 140 mile winds ripped through two years ago, almost two years ago today. So people's lives were completely um, disrupted. They, their homes were destroyed. Uh, the, the structures that protected their food stores were all soaked. So, so they had nothing. And the first thing our partner organization did was provide immediate assistance. And they used, they, they contacted us you know, we can't move forward with our water project right now. We have that money in the, the account. Can we use that for this immediate um, hurricane um, relief work? And so they purchased food and supplies for families in these project communities to make sure they had something to eat. Um, whoops, going the wrong way. They, they um, helped them rebuild their homes and then once they had uh, food on the table so that, and, and water, and they had shelter um, over their heads at night, then they said, what do we need to get them back on their feet financially? So they created these, um, you know, using water first funds, they, they purchased seeds, created gardens, and had the community members um, do some particularly vegetable gardening, things that would um, ripen in two to three months so they'd have income fairly soon. And within three months, uh, they had earned like a third of what they would have earned in a normal agricultural year anyway. So they got their, peop their people in that community back on their feet after you know the worst natural disaster in the region. And they got back to work on on their water project within like four months of that hurricane hitting their area. Um, Zika virus was another issue that, that struck um, communities in Honduras and, and all of Central America. And it was a pretty alarming disease for people, particularly since it had impacts on uh, babies in vitro. So mothers were and families were concerned about the health of their children and they wanted they wanted help with Zika virus. So our local partner organization there did the research that, that they needed to do to figure out what, what can we do to best prevent Zika virus, shared that information with the community members that they worked with, and, and then actually took on some of, of the prevention tasks like fogging for mosquitoes. And this is actually something that also at the same time prevented dengue fever, which was another major health impact, um, another high risk disease in the region. So they were taking care of two of their community's health issues at once. Um, there was also a cyclone that several cyclones have um, struck our project regions in, in Bangladesh and in India, where we had programs up to about 2010. In 2009, for instance, there was a huge cyclone that came right through our project area and the Sundarbans and, and the resulting tidal flow completely inundated uh, thousands of acres of land where people were living. Uh, this wiped out homes because the homes, um, the homes are, are made of mud and, and straw and cow dung and it, they just kind of melted with the tidal, um, the rise in the tide. And that the high water also um, submerged a lot of the wells. So our local partner organization went out to see how their wells were doing. And they they um, created about 20 wells by that time and their wells were working well, but the lines were huge. There were, there were hundreds of people waiting for water. So they quickly went to the, because these were the only wells in the region that were working. So they went to the government, reported what they were seeing, and the government said, we don't have the resources to fix the other wells. 
if we give you some money, can you guys go out and fix all those other wells? So they were used by the government to rehabilitate over 200 wells in that region uh, so that everyone had their emergency drinking water supply and um, could keep family and animals alive just after the, the cyclone. And then the most recent, um, most recent emergency that's impacted everyone has been the latest test of ability to build local capacity has been COVID-19. And across the board, our partners have um, been out sharing information about COVID prevention. These are trained health professionals. They know where to go to get the um, information that's, that people need to protect their health. And uh, they also know how to communicate that information. They've spent years communicating, uh, how do you stay healthy through um, washing hands and, and other covering your food, whatnot. So, so they know how to convey information to their community members and their community members know them and trust them as a source of information. So not only do they provide good information, but they also um, help counter disinformation. And as we saw here in the United States, there's, there's a lot of um, disinformation that's shared. And, and sometimes it can be difficult to um, convince people to follow simple procedures like wearing masks, washing hands. So having um, these local partner organizations who are trusted in the community and, and a good source of information helps to counter that, the um, confusion that may arise from getting conflicting messages. But they, they didn't just provide information, they also were a part of providing you know, concrete solutions. It's one thing to tell people to wash your hands, but if you've got no place to wash your hands, then that's useless. So they found places that, um, that needed hand washing stations and provided them. Um, they provided masks, they provided um, cleaning agents for households. So not just um, giving out information, but also providing actual solutions. Um, in Honduras, they did a great job of using, um, using social media to get information out. So a lot of people are using cell phones. A lot of people are on Instagram. So they use their Facebook, Instagram accounts to, um, to share critical hygiene information, critical prevention, and what to do if you feel sick, how do you, what does it mean to um, quarantine, those kinds of messages got out to everyone. And again, in, in Honduras, they did a great job of also providing um, PPE, medical equipment, and in both Honduras and Bangladesh, they identified families that were um, at risk because they no longer had income. Um, they might be going hungry and they got them food or in the case of Bangladesh, they did some, um, the, our partner organization actually gave families a stipend that were really desperate. So this local partner approach is something that Water First depends on one, to deliver water every day and to do it reliably, but it's also a great tool for communities to rely on uh, in emergency situations, which are going to arise every, every few years in these communities. I don't wanna end without highlighting who these groups are for Water First. So in Honduras, um, our partner is called Cose Pradil, and that's an acronym you can see the different words there, Comité Central Pro Agua y Desarrollo Integral de Lempira. So that is the central committee for water and um, into integrated development in Lempira. That's the name of that organization. Grupo de Saneamento de Bilibiza is our Mozambique group, GSB. That's a uh, san um, sanitation group of Bilibiza. DSK is our partner in um, Bangladesh and DSK stands for Poor People's Hospital. And then Water Action is our partner in 
in Ethiopia. And if you are interested and able, um, these are groups that you can meet yourself. That's why we have organized the water tours and the Global Fellows programs, uh, because we think it's really important that people see and, and meet these outstanding local partner groups and understand how we work together with them to achieve the outcomes that we're, that we're striving for to end the global water crisis. So just wanted to thank you all for joining us today and joining us for this presentation. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures because that baby, you know, is just what you want to see with a baby. It's just so healthy and, uh, and happy. And it's largely because uh, he lives in a community that has access to clean water and toilets. And the community has been well organized by a fantastic local partner organization. And this baby is going to be way healthier than the generation before. So thank you for, um, for providing that for hundreds of communities around the world and for the hundreds of communities in the future that will receive that thanks to this Water First community. All right, um, I am going to stop talking and start entertaining questions. Miles, did we get anything in the um, in the chat box? I was muted still. Uh, folks have refrained from typing their questions, and I think would like to ask them in person. If they All right, can. great, great. Well, let's let's get the questions. Is anyone raising a hand? Who would like to start? <laughs> yes. I'll ask one. Great. Um, thank you for that presentation, by the way, and those um, just great photos and, and great overview. Um, it's, it's inspiring to hear how you guys sort of lean in when there's a natural disaster or, or disease um, and how you shift resources. I guess I've been thinking a lot about um, your partnership in Honduras, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, um, sort of, I don't know if you've learned lessons about, um, I guess I'm thinking about sort of your partnership also with the government. And when you encounter um, corruption, and, and perhaps you're not at all in that community, but um, are there lessons that you've learned, and, and how would you, um, you know, know that um, the resources weren't being shared in the way that um, both you and the partner organization really has intended them to be used? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good question. In terms of um, our work with the government, we have very limited, um, we don't give money to governments. And, and one of the reasons is you lose accountability of that money once it goes into a government account. Um, we do have great accountability with our partners. So if we give them a certain amount of funding, uh, they have, they're contracted to accomplish a certain amount of work with that. And then we go and we check. So we're pretty confident that money is being used um, really efficiently. Um, where, where corruption tends to take place is, is people often have a position in the government that puts them in, in, that gives them an opportunity to request side money for permits. So if you want to, um, to dig a well, you have to get a government permit and that permit might take a long time unless you have some extra resources that can speed it up. Um, our partner organizations then just don't play that game. Um, 
they do a very nice job of saying, you know, this isn't a, a well for a wealthy household. This is a well for a really poor community. So if I spend extra resources to get this done faster, then there's some other poor community that's not going to get a well. Why don't you try to get your resources for your family in another way? And, and they stand firm and, and they win out. So eventually people who might require a bribe say, oh, this is DSK coming to us for a permit. They don't pay bribes. And they're just, they're doing this, you know, I appreciate what they're doing. I'm, I'm gonna just stamp this permit and move on. So um, really strong local partner organizations uh, do a great job of figuring out how to work around um, what we call corruption. And corruption, um, I, it's an interesting term. So uh, if you're a government employee in Bangladesh, you don't get paid much. And part of the reason you don't get paid is because the government kind of assumes you're going to uh, get extra income on the side and you're getting extra income from people who can't afford it. So, so you know, there's some, there's some justice in corruption in some of these situations. Um, so there are, you know, we, we have a situation where if you don't have medical insurance, getting treated for a disease is more expensive than if you do have medical insurance. So other places would call that corruption over here. And we say, well, that's just normal. So, you know, what we might see as corruption there, they see as normal, um, but they understand how to, um, how to get around those, you know, to, they say, you know, you're applying the wrong rules to this situation. It's not water first that's asking to make a well. It's actually these poor communities who are asking to make a well. So you can't ask them to pay a bribe. So that's how they, they get around it. Kind of a long question, sorry about that. Kirk, I've gotten a, a couple questions to the chat that are kind of related that I can kind of synthesize. Um, one relating to if there's an authorization process for using water first funds for um, something other than direct water projects, like the examples mm -hmm. mentioned in um, Mozambique yeah. and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And then kind of more broadly um, to, to that corruption point, um, just how Water First chooses partners in the first place to establish that integrity. Okay. Um, so so the, uh, we have contracts for all the money that we send to all of our partners and uh, they're only allowed to do what is in the contract unless, unless they sign that we, we do a contract amendment. So they might say to us, um, Cyclone uh, Kenneth struck Mozambique. Um, can we get approval to shift this amount of money to Cyclone Recovery? Um, and, then, and then we might raise money for Cyclone Recovery, but then the, the money we have already sent them gets used for that. And then we replace that money with the Cyclone Recovery money. So there's a we do have a, an official process. Um, in, in terms of picking the partner organizations, um, that is, that's one of our key um, activities is, is uh, choosing partner organizations. And we invest a lot of, of uh, resources, time, energy in, in the process of evaluating and picking a good partner organization. Um, which, which involves going to uh, completed projects and talking to community members who use those projects and, and getting a sense for um, how much trust those community members have for the organizations uh, we're looking at. And if, if uh, when you do these, these, uh, these evaluations um, over time, after visiting two or three communities, you get a good sense 
for um, for how good that relationship is between the community members and the partner organizations and how much trust they've they've um, created. And that's really important because um, the community members, they have an opinion about whether or not the resources that a partner organization gets are being used to help them or being used to help that partner organization. So. A couple more in the chat that I can pass along. Um, again, kind of related, but um, you mentioned the the search in Africa for a new partner, given the pause in the mm -hmm. Mozambique program. Um, related to what you were just saying, is, can you talk a little bit more about that search process um, specifically or in general? Yeah. Uh, so specifically, we have uh, five organizations in Kenya that we've kind of narrowed down that we want to go see. And um, one in Zambia, one in Malawi, one in Tanzania. And those are all organizations that submitted profiles to us um, online. We have a little questionnaire and they submit information about past projects and what's what's their um, um, their organizational structure and budget, all kinds of information. From that, we get a sense for which organizations potentially are good matches for us and for for the way we operate. And then we go visit them and and that's where we learn the most is with the site visits. So we started this process last year about this time and then it all froze because of, of COVID. Um, we have the organizations we wanna see and once, once travel restrictions are lifted, then we'll go and um, we'll take a look at them. And it'll probably be a couple different trips, one, one more focused on the Southern African countries and one focused on those Eastern African countries. But we'll probably spend two days with each of the candidates just to get a sense for um, who they are, what they've done, what the quality of their work is. Wendy has her hand up. I'm speaking of the quality of their work. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that um, Water First Partners keep suggesting they keep suggesting ways to improve their work, like adding micro loans for water projects so mm -hmm. that their um, customers, as it is, will be able to afford um, a water project, be able to participate and be able to pay it back in a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been really impressed with how they keep fine tuning how to how to just how to be better how to be better how mm -hmm. to be better it isn't like water first has to hit them over the head and say you've got to measure up mm -hmm. that so that's my impression yeah yeah um so you know the monitoring process is is going out together with our with our partner and looking at past projects at different stages you know something that's two years old something that's five years old something that's even older and identifying the strengths and, and weaknesses and challenges. And then um, it, it's usually up to our partner to, to say, oh, you know, we collaboratively found this issue. Maybe the issue is that after 15 years, communities are beginning to get nervous about the future. Our, our project um, was, has a, a 20 year design life. Well, we're five years away from that. So does that mean that we're going to have to rebuild everything in five years. Um, so, so the community may be feeling anxiety about that. So then uh, we can go back and say, hey, this was this is something we noticed. Um, our partner hopefully agrees. And then and then we say, well, what's your what's your solution for that? Um, um, a great example of that would be in in Bangladesh. Uh, we were going from project to project and we saw a huge range in the quality of the construction of wells. So some were just slapped together and some were really, really nice. So we said, you know, we got to get this quality control issue fixed here. And they came up with a solution, which was we're going to have um, we're going to have training sessions for the contractors who build these wells. And we're going to teach them exactly what we want done. And then in order to 
be a, and then you'll be on a list if you've done the training of people who know how to do this properly. So we'll give that list to the communities that are gonna build new wells and they'll choose you. So if you do this training, you'll have work. And it was really, really successful. So now the quality is, is very consistent and it's excellent. So there's, there's a good example of the partner coming up with a great solution to something we both observed as an issue. Any other questions out there? I can't see everyone right now. So if someone has their hand up, I might be missing it. Calorie view. Kirk, I'll ask a question. It's Lynn. Yes. Um, so you did kind of touch on this, but there it, it is very impressive, the capacity of the partners. Do most of them have that capacity when you, I mean, I know they have to have a certain level of capacity, mm -hmm. uh, organizational structure and things like that in place when we start or you start with them. But is a, does Water First do any of the capacity building as well? Do they increase that capacity? Is that part of what the work you do with the partner organizations is? Um, yes. So uh, Kose Pradil in Honduras is a great example. Um, they had all the tools to, to do the best projects in the world. But oh, I'd say 15 years ago, they were getting almost no funding. So they had this incredible operation that was capable of, of transforming communities and it was just lying there unutilized. Um, at that time, Water First was probably sending them you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year because that's what we could afford. We're a, a small organization, but as we've grown, we've increased their budget, and now they're doing seven or eight projects every year with our money. We're giving them three quarters of a million dollars every year. So we've 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 taken an, uh, a group that was kind of dormant and. And, and now they are just humming and they've got seven um, project technicians working full time all year. Um, DSK is the same. We, we started funding them one project office uh, in, in Dhaka and now they've got five project offices, one in Kulna, one in Chattagram, the, sec the second and third largest cities and they've got three in DACA. So this strategy allows us to grow the best groups in a region and, and make them sort of the, the premier um, water project implementer in that, in that area. So it sounds like more like um, funding capacity versus like skills capacity. You're not teaching them, there's nobody teaching them book the book keep, bookkeeping skills or things like that. It's really more about the funding capacity. Is that right? Well, those things, uh, those things they build in the process of growing. So right now we're working on with DSK, we're working on uh, record keeping. <laughs> like you guys would do much better with the database than with a spreadsheet. So, um, so we're working on that. So there are some, some, technical skills. And they're things we share from one place to another. So, hey, we've seen this in, um, we've seen this in Honduras. Why don't we transfer that to Ethiopia? We've seen this in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was uh, our first partner that was really doing a lot of metering. We said, man, if they can do this metering in Ethiopia, they can do metering in Honduras. And so over time, Honduras has embraced metering. So we kind of share ideas back and forth between these um, these partner groups. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Still not sure if I have everyone on screen. Miles, do you see anyone with a question? Uh, I haven't. I haven't received any more in the chat. Um, they're still great. Not everybody has their video on, but I don't see any hands raised. Mm -hmm. Anyone have anything they want to just toss in? Add. Doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment. Steve might have a comment or two. So Steve Deem um, is a, he's on the call. I don't know where he is. He was eating his lunch, so he's hiding. There he is, there he is. Um, so Steve Deem has been a part of the Water First community from the very beginning. I mean, I think he met Marla before I met Marla, which was in 2000. And um, he works for the state of Washington uh, as um, water quality specialist, but then we hire him to do engineering reviews when we go go make a monitoring trip. Um, so he has, he knows these partners really well and particularly uh, the technical side. Steve, did you yeah, have Lynn, anything you wanted, wanted to throw in? Yeah, Lynn, I wanted to kind of follow up on the capacity building. Um, it's rightful to break things apart. Um, sometimes I think uh, we as Westerners and uh, Americans, we try to break down everything into little silos and we kind of lose the connectedness of all this stuff that goes together. So coming back to Honduras with that capacity building, um, one of the biggest things that's come out of sustained uh, involvement with them is, uh, and I'm sure we are doing this with the best intentions, but actually turning the mayors of these different municipalities into competitors, competitors with each other um, to scramble to get our funding or get Costa Brazil's funding in their municipalities. So now all of a sudden they're ponying up you know, real money. Um, so that has actually really uh, made the whole thing take off. And, and this is a case where everything that uh, Kirk said uh, kind of echoes and reinforces, uh, Costa Brazil is very effective at, at really squashing um, uh, the corruption or the, 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 the payoff type thing. And so then it's like to stop asking for it. And now they're like, okay, not only we're not trying to get money from you, but here we're gonna kick in 20% of total cost. And we're going to help support now uh, establishment at the government level a tracking system or a surveillance system. So it kind of goes uh, many different ways. And then on the technical side, I think one of the, uh, it's actually we're kind of on our a high and mighty horse here, I think. We have to be careful, we could fall. Um, but we think that the whole approach to toilets and that's a pit latrine is an acceptable way to deal with going to the bathroom is ridiculous. And so we are now pushing uh, for poor flush toilets, so essentially the toilets that all of us would like to use. Um, in many parts of the world, you squat, but it's still porcelain and you have water and flushes and you can be clean and it doesn't smell like you know, an outhouse. So that is something that really came out of uh, a first uh, organization we worked with in India, which we have now, I'll have to say that we've transplanted around uh, to all of our partners that are using that. Honduras was actually using that also, but that's another example of, I'll say cross-pollination, but it's also part of the capacity building. All right, those are some thoughts. Thank you. All right, well, if folks don't have additional questions. I just wanna give a shout out to Wendy. Hello, are you in, up in Sunny Lopez? You're, uh, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that again. Yes, I'm in Sunny Lopez. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ian. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Kirk. Good to see you. And I highly recommend, actually, I'll ask Wendy's traveled with us. Do you recommend uh, visiting a Water First project site? Well, there, there's been one downside to traveling with Water First, which uh -huh. is now when I travel on my own, it seems really dull and boring. <laughs> it's kind of taken the life out of that. Because when you travel with Water First, you feel like you're really doing something. You're really learning something. Um, 
sometimes you even get to help out and it's absolutely a highlight. I've been to mm -hmm. Ethiopia, uh, Honduras and Bangladesh with them mm -hmm. and uh, just couldn't recommend it more. He yeah, it's a nice way. Me. He didn't pay me for that either. <laughs> I was just going to say, we'll give you your little, you know, extra top positive after everybody gets off the Zoom uh, call. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a great way because you're really integrated into the community through the local partner organization. The, um, the respect that our local partners have gained and earned with communities is extended to us as visitors. So... Um, it's a it's a special experience to to be in those communities um, with it, you know in concert with our partner organizations. So, Ian, did you have any any questions? I didn't have any questions, but it's great to see your face and everyone else's. Um, and you guys do some incredible work. You guys are rock stars, that's for sure. Um, I can sec I can certainly second Wendy's notion about traveling with you guys. It is an impeccable experience to get your, you know, hands dirty and work with the community and see everything that's going on in the ground. So, yeah. You almost made the slideshow. I was I was considering putting a picture. There's that one good picture of you uh, carrying water in Ethiopia. I was going to say, where was, I didn't see myself. <laughs> it came close. You came close. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, we are going to do this. Um, is it Sarah, are we going to do this quarterly or was it like three times a year? Um, we're hoping about three times a year. Three times a year. Okay. Um, topics. And then I think our next topic uh, we're going to talk about, uh, so some of the data that's coming out of Bangladesh is interesting. There is, there's the work that we are funding, uh, but then there's the other work that's getting done um, that is, is created by our partner organization, but, but it's, it's off the books in terms of um, everything that happens in Bangladesh is, is done with a loan. Um, so they report to us all the loans that they've made to these community groups to build toilets, to construct wells. But there are a whole bunch more wells and toilets that are being built because of this, uh, this it's called the CBO, the community-based organization, is the local group that our partner is forming. That, that group goes through its neighborhood and is telling everyone, you need clean water, you need clean toilets. And there's a lot more that's happening besides just uh, the, the stuff that we're directly funding. And so uh, we're trying to, to get the exact numbers on that and, and share that with you all because it's, there's a multiplier effect that's happening because these, these really motivated local groups talk to their neighbors and convince their neighbors to do things they're not otherwise doing because you know they may not know what to do, but now, DSK is here and they can talk you through all the steps. So it'll be easy. And it, it just facilitates um, change in a whole, in a whole region. So that's, I think what our next, is that right, Sarah? All right. That's where we're going. So stay tuned and we'll see you. And hopefully between now and then we can get to Bangladesh and do some of the research ourselves but maybe not. We'll see. I'm getting impatient to travel. <laughs> well, we're nearly at our hour, but um, if there are further questions or if any other matters come up after, feel free to um, just respond to Kirk's email that had the Zoom link. That's kirkanderson at waterfirst.org or our main inbox info at waterfirst.org and we can get um, you connected to the right information.